Joy. It's hard for me to even say that word without thinking of that Job song. I got that joy, 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 joy. Where? Daddy, my heart. Yeah, you guys are so convincing. Daddy, my heart. <laughs> joy in Hebrew. Again, you guys, I'm going to struggle with this. I'm sure there's there's some, some wordologists out there that are going to be like, you pronounced that wrong. I said, no, I didn't. I put my, my southern twang on it. The word joy in Hebrew is sima. It's as, as a noun is. And samak as a verb form. It's found over 400 times in the Bible. That seems pretty significant, don't it? You ask. <clears throat> One of the questions I had to answer in seminary that's always stuck with me because I've, I've always gone back to that question and that paper that I had to write. Do I still believe this? Do I still, does my ministry or the ministry I'm involved in still mirror image this? And they said, well, what is the theme of the Bible? A lot of people took love. I thought that was the easy way out. His relationship with us was, was, was my answer. So, but it's it's the same thing that's throughout this entire book. And, and I look and I'm thinking, my joy is now in a verb and it's over 400 times in this thing. That's kind of significant. Well, what is it? What is the joy defined as? And you know, we don't, we're not supposed to look at definitions like the world does, right? This is the definition. The biblical definition says, in both the Old and New Testament, joy is consistently the mark, both individually of the believer and corporately of the church. It's a quality, not an emotion. Ooh, you make me happy. That's great. Pizza makes me happy. Barbecue makes me happy. I'm not going to talk to you about that, 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 that rolled pork goodness that I made last night. I was, oh my goodness, that made me happy. It's not joyful. If you look at the joy message from last year, there's a video that I used from, a, from someone who's talking about the joy that, that her grandson brought her. But he's not the supplier of joy. Why? Because it's a quality, not an emotion. It's grounded upon God himself. And it's derived from him, which characterizes the Christian's life on earth. We should have joy as believers. Joy is something that we get as a gift with our salvation. We talked last week about, you know, in one of the verses last week, it, it combined joy and peace, right? Joy, all these Advent these Advent words that we throw at you during this Advent season, they, they go together. You, you can't stand one on its own. We, we, we broached this topic with Doc's Sunday School class last Sunday evening as well. It's a combination meal deal. Upsized in biblical form. They're not independent. Joy comes with salvation. So when I stop and I have Don re-sing re that same song over again, we should be happy. We should sound joyful. We have salvation. There is joy in our salvation. Church, do you believe that? There is joy in my salvation. Say that for me. There is joy in my salvation. You sounded so joyful when you said that too. It's okay to get up to get we get upset over politics and we raise our voices over that. We get upset over over football. We won't mention the smacking that the Colts got because I can't because of the smacking that the Denver Broncos get on a weekly basis. We get upset and we get loud about that. I took my boy to a, a basketball game on, on, on Thanksgiving Eve, which is like the, the tradition around here, and he, he fell in love with the game. I was like, man, I gotta get into basketball again. I have a hatred for that game. That's a whole nother, whole nother topic. But he got excited. And he, he'd get up and shout and clap. We should be doing the same thing for our salvation. It should, we should be joyful. But see, joy has a tendency to fade, doesn't it? A lot of things that, that, that will cause and will eat away at our joy. Um, and we're going to be looking at one of those things from David's perspective. You have God's word, I trust that you do. We're going to be in, in Psalms chapter 51. I'm going to ask that you stand for the reading of the word. 
I know I've only got one verse up there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna add a couple more because that's what God's been doing to me here recently. <laughs> verse 10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Church says, Create. Create. Woo, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Church say renew. renew. Do not cast me down from your presence, verse 11, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12 says, Restore. Say restore. restore. To me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This is the reading of his word. Father, we ask that you take your word. Allow it to grow within us. Allow that word to, to marinate within our lives, to show the holiness that you've called us to live. Father, this, this, this verse is my prayer today. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. <clears throat> Only you can do so. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I want to put this in context, because as, as I always do, I'm kind of glad this is Children's Church Week. <laughs> if you, I don't know about your Bibles, but in my Bible... On Psalm 51, it says, For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. David was one of the best kings that Israel ever came to know. In their history books, one of the best kings. But none of us are perfect, are we? Took a step away from the, that life of holiness, and he had an effect, had a... Had a and I kind of steered away from God's path that he had. He made decisions that were of, his, of the flesh. And this is his repentance letter. I'll encourage you to go back and read this. What's that have to do with joy? His sin stole his joy. What? But it's a gift. I know there's a, there's a lot of Christians out there that are of a different Protestant form to say once a gift is given, it can never be taken from you. Sin stole his joy. Otherwise, he wouldn't be praying, renew it. We wouldn't hear prophets of, throughout the Old Testament saying the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> and those prophets said it when they were at a weak point. When they have nothing but to lean on his joy. See, David's sin took that joy. I looked, I got a, there's not much about Nathan in the Bible. He's, he's here, there, and everywhere, but he's throughout David's life, so he, he was a constant figure. He was someone that, that David relied on for his knowledge, relied on for his wisdom. So even as the king, and kings have big heads, I mean, we, we see it in our own, in our own country, right? No matter who's president, they got a really big old head. I've done this, this, and this. Listen to them after 100 days after they've been elected. And they're talking about all their resume of what they've just done over the 100 days. It's all about themselves. I'm sure David had the same thing. There was times when he was humbled. There was times when he was proud. This time of sin was obviously a time when he was proud. He thought he could step outside the norm. Get away with it. And he was called out. See, when we have sin, it, it creeps in on that joy that we have. It tears away from it. So we have to understand that we have a need for salvation. I think if you talk to any believer, we have a need for salvation, but we need to go a step further, friends. We have a need for restoration. Anybody else has taken a walk, a walk away from the church, walk away from God, and they still believe in God? They still believe in Jesus, but they haven't been restored to that relationship. There is a need for restoration in, in the first, in the same chapter, verses uh, two through five. It says, "Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin." He's asking for repentance, not forgiveness, friends. Repentance. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. My sin is always there against you. You only I have sinned, and I have done what is evil in your sight. Again, he's separating the, the sin. Sin was, it's not illegal. Adultery is not illegal, right? There's no laws against adultery. 
you're right, doctor. What's that? My point is you can look at, you can do something illegal according to, to God's law, right here, and still be fine with society. See, David was, was separating. I've sinned against your sight. I don't care about the, the society's norms. I've sinned against your sight. So he was recognizing in this prayer in the very beginning, Lord, I have sinned. I need, I need restoration. I need to be acquitted from this, this wrongdoing. And the only one that can do that acquittal is you. <clears throat> he didn't look to be canceled or to call for the cancellation of, of other people. I'm sure he had the power to say, you know what, Nathan, we've gone a long way. We've gone, we've gone back, we go back, we go, we have history, but you know what, I'm I'm canceling your position. So that's what society does nowadays. We just cancel whoever the opposition is. I don't like what they have to say, so I'm just gonna ignore what they have to say. This book hasn't changed in thousands of years. I can't ignore what it has to say. There is a resistance to salvation. See, David recognized I have a need for it. And then there's a resistance. He says the sin goes before me. That's not a new concept. If we look back in Genesis, God, God warns those two brothers. The Lord warns that one brother. Be careful. Sin is crouching at your door. Doesn't mean that sin's just right in there. It's crouching. It's hidden. It's ready to strike. You go out into our society, it's easy to sin, isn't it? Sin's easy. It's the easy way. It's acceptable. It's celebrated in all many cases. But see, David had to understand. He, he had to recognize not only do I need this salvation, I need this restoration. I am not going to ignore the fact that it's this, that, that sin, the, the possibility of it, is sitting right there at, at my feet. Surely I was sinful at birth, he says in verse 5. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And you desire faithfulness. He goes on. Doesn't matter what, where, we're, where we're at in society. But pastor, I have a past. I have a history. It doesn't matter. That's what, that's what David said. I've been sinful from birth. Yet you still desire faithfulness. He still desires holiness. Going back to our verse. This doesn't sound too joyful to me, pastor. In the middle of Advent season, we should be having happy sermons. And I do uh, see this sermon as a happy sermon because of what this verse says. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Ooh, that means it can be restored. That means God will refill me up. That means when our tank gets empty, God says, come here, let me, let me top you off. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The effects of salvation are a joyful and willing spirit. See, this happens when we when we have unity with, with, with God through, our, through Jesus Christ. It happens when we have peace and hope. Again, if we look at going back to that first that first question that I was asked in, in, in Bible colleges, what is the theme of this? Every, this is not a history book, but everything in here gives us everything we need to know for the salvation of our spirit. The salvation of our soul. You know, everything that we need for, for life everlasting is found inside this book. <coughs> it's the gospel. It's salvation. It goes hand in hand with a desire to do his will. Willingness of heart. It goes hand in hand with joy. See, the joy comes with his salvation. It's not the joy of my actions. It's not the joy of my position in life. It's not the joy of my profession. It's not the joy of my past. It's not the joy of my history. It's not the joy of my future. It's not the joy of the politician that's, that's been elected. It's his joy. And David's already set that apart. <coughs> the other thing besides our, our need for, and how sin tears away our joy Friends, if you have salvation, you have joy. Can you say, I have joy this morning, friends? Say, I have joy. I have joy. Well, 
I'm like, somebody over here is starting to get it. <laughs> I'll start calling people out. No, I'm just kidding. Like, I'm sitting in front anymore. That's why we sit in the back, Pastor. <laughs> you, we can't be bitter and miserable throughout our life if we have salvation. We can't. If we're bitter and miserable, we're not looking at life the way that he wants us to look at it. Our life is temporary. Do you understand that? We, we were only here for, but for a peck of eternity. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, it says. Where does his salvation come from? It comes from his birth. Remember when he was born and the angels showed up to the shepherds, you know, the really rich shepherds, right? No, those poor boys. I bring you tidings of good news that will bring kind of sort of good joy throughout there. No, it says great joy. I'm bringing you news. Just the simple spoken word of what I'm about to tell you is going to cause joy to be great across the earth. Oh, but pastor, I've had a rough week. Our joy is not in our week. It's his joy. Why? Because if, if our lives are, are but a pinprick in our eternity, what, what's this week? How short is this week? Hmm. We have great joy in the birth of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. It was proclaimed so much that it scared those shepherds on the side of that, on the side of that hill. I can just imagine in the, in the midst of the darkness, here comes this great light. And we bring you good tidings of great joy. Well, okay, I'm, I'm freaked out. I don't know about the joyful part, but I'm scared. He brought joy through his perfect life. His life was perfect. He brought restoration to those he met in this physical lifetime. And I'm thinking of all those situations. Not everybody was grateful. We have those lepers where only one came back and said, thanks. We have many healings that have happened where joy wasn't really a part of it. <laughs> Or we can be one of the, we can be that leper that comes back and says, guess, guess what? I've been healed. Thank you so much. We don't do it for those that, are, that give us the cold shoulder, though. And there will be plenty of uh, in, in our lifetime that will give us the cold shoulder. It's one of the things I'm realizing with the, with the jail ministry. There are going to be people that I get to see and build a relationship with that will give me the cold shoulder. Does that mean I'm going to stop? Absolutely not. Because I have a friend down in Florida that had changed his life, his time in jail. Why won't I stop? Because there's still that one leper that's going to come back and say, all praise be to God. Look what he's brought me from. If Jesus had plenty of reasons to stop his ministry, he didn't. I think of that Samaritan woman that Hurried off to her household and to her neighborhood and said, You gotta hear this guy. You gotta hear this guy. He spent a couple of days in their home sleeping and eating and, and, and telling them stories and, and, and preaching the good news to them. And they became believers. Joy. Nicodemus, that conversation he had with that Pharisee, Nicodemus. Most of his conversations with Pharisees were quite short. Because either they were trying to peg him against the wall. Did that stop him from talking to Nicodemus? No. Nicodemus came from the same class of folks. He could have said, oh, you're the enemy. I'm not going to talk to you. Why should I talk to somebody in a, in a jail through a, through a glass? Just because I know as soon as they get out, they're going to totally forget about anything that we ever talked about. No, see, Jesus said, oh, I still want to have a conversation with you, Nicodemus. There was joy from that, from that conversation. That conversation gave us one of the most remembered scriptures of all time. For God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. I'm so, that, that verse alone gives me joy. 
Where else did that joy? All the way up to the his, the ending life, him ending his life on a cross. When one guy to the side says, "I want to see you again," he goes, "You, you're, you're going to see me." Talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I've seen a, a pastor who, who who did this a lot more funnier than I could possibly do it. And he's like, "Well, how did this guy get into heaven? He doesn't know church membership. He's never been baptized. He never had communion. He doesn't know what salvation is." Why are you here? The guy in the middle cross told me I could be here. Oh, you can't argue with that, can you? Joy. Because he said I could be here. If he says that, he said that to a thief on a cross, and he's saying that to you and I now, we have the opportunity to share our joy. Let's not wait to the last moment. There was joy in his resurrection. Can you imagine? I love the fact that Thomas was a, <laughs> he's a disciple for that three and a half years. But what do we know Thomas as? Is that doubting guy. Once. He doubted once. But that's what he's scarred with his entire life. But I, I see these men, these, these disciples, these followers, that are, they're in this room, they're, it's locked. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears before him. Who opened the door? Nobody. The joy. And when Thomas came in, and he said, I heard the rumor you were here, and I had to see it. He goes, yeah, yeah, you want to touch my hands and my feet? No. In full joy, he drops down to his knees. Those women coming back from the tomb that they found empty. It says, the Bible says they're full of fear and joy. Fear and joy. I don't know. Every place that I see a, an angel described in the Bible, it would cause me to be fearful too. It's a scary looking, scary, scary sight to imagine. Do all angels look this way? Is that what the women were greeted at the time? I'd be scared too. But they had news that gave them joy. We have every reason in the world to be joyful, friends. We walk through this world and we go, joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of heaven, Lord of might. Where's our joy? It should be easy to show our joy in church. Let's show our joy on Monday. Why are you so happy? Don't you have chaos in your life? Absolutely, but I got Jesus in my life too. I have salvation. That the, the chaos in my life is so temporary. I have joy. You see, if we truly believe that birth, we truly believe that life, we truly believe that resurrection, and we have a relationship with the Father, it's easy to have joy on Sundays. We're protected here, aren't we? I always seen this as a spiritual safe place. I know that's not a, that's not a woke term, y'all. But this is a spiritual safe place. Why? Because we have people on Tuesdays that come in and pray all over this building. <laughs> and so his spirit rolls through this place every single day, I promise you. As soon as I put the key in the lock every morning, I was like, oh, glory. I'm in his house. It's a spiritual safe place. But we don't live our lives here, do we? We live our lives at work. We live our lives at home. We live our lives... In chaos, we live our lives with, with financial battles. We live our lives with legal battles. We live our lives with medical battles. I'm going to encourage you to take that relationship home. Don't just leave it here. That relationship to be worn on a daily basis. See, no one will take the joy that's complete and full. Only you can allow sin into your life to nitpick it away but if you take that joy no one's going to thieve it from you and steal it from you the enemy, enemy's going to attempt to tempt you remember sin's always crouching at our door I love when Old Testament works with New Testament and it just go, kind of goes hand in hand the woman at the well that Samaritan woman Jesus said go and sin no more doesn't mean that she wasn't tempted because she's still known as the woman from the well. She still has that same, it doesn't say anything about her reputation being 
cleansed, does it? That's what happens in our life. We mess up, and we all know David is the day is the guy who cheated on his wife, cheated with another man's wife. Then he killed the man. We don't think about the David that that had an opportunity to kill his king, but said, "No, I'm going to take the righteous move." We don't think about the David that that. Every time his men went out to war, he went with them, except for that time where he said, no, I'm going to take a break and, because I got this good-looking woman that was next door. We think of David the failure. I'm going to tell you, friends, God doesn't see you as the failure. God sees you as the redeemed. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have every reason to be joyful because he doesn't see all that junk behind us. We can allow that joy to diminish in the presence of sin. But nobody is responsible for removing that joy but yourself. We have joy. I can't say those words without a smile on my face. Say, I have joy, friends. I have joy. And y'all can say it without a smile on your face. A couple smiles over there. I don't know if Ms. Lisa kicked John or not, but he, he kind of left. <laughs> Joy, it's a gift. It can be interrupted. It creeps in our, in our life through the sin. It crouches at our door. The sin can steal our joy. It separates us from the presence of God. So you notice that God's not, this presence does not exist where sin is. I hate to break it to you, but he chooses. God is everywhere, but he's not going to be present in a, in a sinful situation. They're opposite. It's like oil and water. Sin just diminishes the testimony that we are commanded to give. Again, we look at David and we think, man, that David was he was the guy that cheated, right? He wasn't the one. We forget about the David that fought the Goliath, that saved his entire nation. He's the one that cheated on his wife, right? We forget about the, the humble one that says, no, I'm not going to strike my king even though he's trying to take my life. It diminishes the testimony. So I want to encourage you to stay away. To guard your hearts. As, as, as God once told Cain, sin is crouching at your door. If you're not careful, it will take over your life. Because I don't want sin to crouch at my door and take over my life. Because if it does, I, I lose that joy. Friends, I know that this is a temporary stop in, in my forever. I'm only here for a short, but for a short time. I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do. When asked why I was going so fast in my studies and through uh, Bible college, uh, the board down in Florida asked me, why are you going so fast? You're, no one's going through this except for this guy that just left us. Do you know him? Yeah, he's in my church too. We're side by side. Why, what's, what's the rush? I've wasted enough of God's time. I ain't got but a small amount of time on the, in my eternity. I want to do as much as I can. Because I love him that much. Because I'm not going kind to of disappoint myself. I don't want to let him down anymore. But see, then I look at the flip side of that coin. When I do his will, when I'm in that relationship, I get to have peace when the rest of society goes, huh? How? I get to have joy. Deep in my heart. I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart to stay. Anybody else want to give up the joy? Anybody else want to claim their joy? Anybody else need a replenishing of their joy? I'm going to ask my brother Don to come up. See, it's hard to share a joy when it's incomplete. So that was um, David's prayer. David, by all means, was a righteous guy. David had his issues. He, without sin, will cast the first stone. Right? But when he saw that he had his issues and he saw that he had failed in the righteousness of God, he gets on his face and he starts off, Have mercy on me, O God. Verse 1. You catch yourself in the, in the midst of sin? Look at Psalm 51. But don't you dare skip over 12. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He goes on in 13, Then I will teach your tra teach transgressors your ways. I'm not going to keep it for myself. I'm going to teach this. I'm going to share it. I'm going to spread it. Why? Because you have refilled my joy. I can't bear to keep it bottled up anymore. My prayer today is, we're going to open up the altars. You respond if you want to. It's up to you. It's between you and him. Is your joy incomplete? Do you need to be refilled? There's not a day that goes by that I, I don't need to be refilled by his joy. Let's pray. Father, it's hard to admit when we have sin in our life that has crouched in our door. But the prayer of David stands out over and over and over again. He, he, he pleads to refill his joy. That verse is short, but it's so powerful. Restore me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a spirit that is willing to do what you have, what you want me to do. Give me the strength to sustain me so I do not fall on that, on that journey and that will. As, you, as, we, as I do or attempt to do what you call me to do, give me the strength that will keep me standing in the face of sin so I can go over or around it or avoid it. But in those moments when we have fallen to sin, Lord, we ask that you give us the presence of mind to cry out, have your mercy on me, O God. I repent of this way because I know this sin takes away the joy that, that your salvation brings. Nobody likes seeing a grouchy Christian. Nobody likes seeing a bitter one. Lord, I want to be that joyful Christian that no matter what my life throws at me, your joy shines through. People look at me and say, how, how, how can you have joy? Let me tell you how my, where my joy comes from. It is the joy of the Lord that becomes my strength. It's the joy of the Lord that gives me strength to get me through what life is throwing at me. Father, we thank you for moving. It's my, my personal prayer that you restore your joy in me, that others may be see that joy that I may go out, like David said, and tell the world what your joy is. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Friends, know that I love you, know that I'm praying for you, and we're going to sing one more before we're dismissed. Page 422. Despite my thick tongue, uh, I am still shouting glory. So I hope you can say the same. And we will see you this evening, uh, hopefully at the Bible study. Have a blessed afternoon.